Good evening. More than 10 million years ago, a funny thing happened in Centaurus A. Now, Centaurus A is a galaxy. I'm afraid you won't see it from here because it's too far south in the sky. But I'd like to show you two pictures of it, both taken in from Australia with a telescope known as the UK Schmidt, one of the best telescopes we in Britain have built during the past 20 years, I think. Here, first of all, is Centaurus A, photographed way back in 1975. And this, of course, is a negative picture, so the stars appear black against a white background. And that bright streak you can see running diagonally across the galaxy is, in fact, a dark lane. Now, here's a second picture of the same galaxy taken on May the 3rd this year. And you can see that something has happened. There in the dark lane to the lower left, a new star has appeared. And that's a tremendous outburst called a supernova. And because it's the seventh supernova to have been discovered this year, it's known as 1986G. Now, a supernova really is a colossal outburst. What happens is that a formerly very faint star flares up to millions of times its normal brightness and may indeed shine as brightly as all the other stars in its galaxy put together. In our own particular galaxy, we haven't seen a naked eye supernova since the year 1604. But we can see sometimes the remnants of past supernovae. And here's a photograph of one, the remnant we call Cassiopeia A. And that probably would have been seen as a supernova round about the year 1667. But unfortunately, there was too much gas and dust in the way, so we couldn't see it at all. But there is its remnant. And as you can see, the kind of circular structure spreading away from an old explosion center. And with that kind of supernova, what happens is that a very massive star comes to the end of its life. There's an implosion, followed by an explosion, and the star destroys itself. And that's known as a type 2 supernova. We'll come to type 1 supernovae. They're different in a few moments. Well, the trouble is that supernovae are very uncommon. We would like to study one from close range, but they don't occur often enough. And we have to content ourselves with studying supernovae in external galaxies millions of light years away. And quite a number of those have been discovered in recent years. There's one man who makes a special study of hunting for supernovae in outer galaxies, and he is an amateur the Reverend Robert Evans, who lives in Australia and has his own telescopes there. That's a 16-inch telescope. Well, at the last meeting of the International Astronomical Union, which was held in India last year, Robert Evans gave a paper and he received a standing ovation, which, for an amateur, is something very unusual indeed. I wasn't actually uh, at that particular meeting. I was too busy looking at Halley's Comet. But uh, Dr. Paul Murdin was, and you were there, Paul, weren't you? And you actually met Robert Evans, who, of course, did discover this new outburst in Centaurus A. How exactly does he go about hunting for supernovae? Bob Evans has got a, a list in his mind, um, in fact, a list on a piece of paper as well, of about 100, maybe more, galaxies uh, that he works through as often as he can, looking at each one. He spends a couple of minutes uh, looking at them one by one, and he's memorized the appearance of them in the same way that he's uh, memorized the uh, appearance of the faces of his friends. And just as he would notice when a pimple grew on the nose of one of his friends, uh, he notices when a, uh, a, a new star can appear in the field of these um, uh, galaxies. Uh, since he's making a deliberate attempt to try to find supernovae, it, this is not just a random list of galaxies that he searches. He's chosen the galaxies which are uh, near enough so that a supernova that a occurred in them would appear bright enough that he'd be able to pick it up yeah. with the telescopes that he, um, that he has access to. Uh, he's um, not tempted by the prettier galaxies, um, uh, the, uh, doesn't spend his time looking at them if they're so far away that uh, supernovae wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be seen in them. Now on uh, May the 3rd, uh, he was going through his, uh, his list of galaxies. Uh, he'd worked through uh, the galaxies in Virgo and uh, Coma, and uh, it come to the ones in Centaurus. And uh, uh, he came to Centaurus A about midnight, and straight away he noticed uh, that there was a new star in the field of Centaurus A. Uh, he recognized that uh, this was a new star because he'd last looked at Centaurus A um, on April the 24th. Um, you may remember there was a lunar eclipse that, um, uh, that night. I do. And uh, uh, it normally, with the, f with the moon at full, as it is just before a lunar eclipse, the light from the moon swamps the details of faint galaxies. You can't distinguish features in them. 
Uh, but uh, during the eclipse, when the shadow of the Earth falls upon the face of the moon, the sky grows darker. And Evans used the, uh, the hour or so to go through his list. And he looked at Centaurus A and remembered distinctly that there was no new star there. So uh, when he came to uh, look at Centaurus A on May the 3rd, uh, the new star stuck out, he said, like an organ <laughs> stop. Well, um, uh, there was one check that he had to make first before he, uh, before he really was convinced that this was a supernova. Uh, he had to be sure that this wasn't an asteroid. Now, the asteroids are minor planets uh, which um, orbit uh, the solar system between Mars and Jupiter. And uh, m there are many of them about 12th magnitude, the, the magnitude of the star which he saw. Um, and uh, he wanted to check that this uh, new star wasn't one of these. So he went on through his list for about a half an hour, looking at uh, further galaxies, and came back to Centaurus A. And uh, he um, then um, discovered that the new star had not moved. Uh, in half an hour, the motion of an asteroid uh, would have been large enough to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to be noticeable. When the star hadn't moved, he knew this was really a supernova. So uh, he straight away got on the telephone to the International Astronomical Union Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams, and uh, uh, later on that day, Brian Marsden, who's its director, uh, sent out uh, telegrams uh, all over the world to the observatories that, uh, that study supernovae, prompting them to, uh, to get on and look at it. Meanwhile, uh, Evans uh, uh, phoned a friend of his, uh, Rob McNaught, uh, at Coonabarabran at the Siding Spring Observatory. McNaught works um, on the UK Schmidt Telescope, and about half past two that morning, McNaught arranged for the UK Schmidt Telescope to photograph Centaurus A in order to get a photographic confirmation of the discovery. And uh, it did. It was the photograph which was shown at the beginning of this program and which we see on our, our screen now. McNaught also went to Tom Cragg, who's one of the night assistants on the Anglo-Australian Telescope. And uh, uh, together they got out uh, Tom's uh, telescope and uh, had a look at the supernova themselves. And Tom went across to the Anglo-Australian Telescope control desk Tom's got a house um, no more than 100 yards away from the telescope. And uh, he managed to persuade the professional astronomers who were working on the telescope there that night to measure the position of the supernova. Uh, in fact, to, to convince them that it was a supernova um, and not just uh, some, some field star or so, uh, he had to get a picture of, uh, of Centaurus A from a poster which had been stuck up on the library wall and take it up to the control room in order to demonstrate that it really was um, a, a supernova. And that was the position which was... Uh, uh, telegraphed all over the world by Marsden. And I gather that what you've done since then is to take all the available observations and construct a light curve. Yes, uh, Evans and uh, McNaught and Craig were kind enough to give me their visual observations of the magnitude of the supernova as it's developed over the, over the, last, um, uh, over the last few months. Uh, it started off, of course, invisible on April the 24th, below 15th magnitude, when uh, Evans uh, uh, couldn't see it. It must have shot up pretty rapidly uh, from that time up to uh, his discovery of it on May the 3rd. From May the 3rd till about May the 11th, it uh, got brighter. And then from May the 11th, uh, it's gradually faded away, um, meandering up and down in, in brightness until now it's uh, passing 15th magnitude and becoming invisible. Now, uh, from the light curve, uh, we can actually tell what kind of supernova this was, what type it was. The light curves of supernovae uh, are two distinct sorts. A uh, type 1 supernova light curve um, goes up very rapidly, of course. Then it goes down fairly rapidly as well. Um, but then it's the, the decline slackens off, and the light curve, de the light decreases regularly at a regular pace over um, 70, 80, 100 days, something like that. A type 2 light curve goes up just as rapidly, um, but it hangs up there a little bit. It uh, doesn't fall uh, in brightness as quickly as a Type 1, uh, but then it plummets at around uh, 70 to 80 days, much faster than a Type 1 does. We could uh, check um, whether or not uh, the Centaurus A supernova was a Type 1 or a Type 2 by having a look at the light curves. Let's begin with Type 2. Right, let's uh, try to superimpose the Type 2 light curve on the data f for Centaurus A. If we bring in the light curve, we can try to line it up so that the brightness fits, that's the up and down direction, and the date of outburst fits, that's the sideways motion. And um, mm. that, I think, is the best we can do. Not too good. No, the points seem to fall underneath the Type 2 light curve at about 30 days after maximum.
I think there's something wrong. Let's try type 1 instead. If we bring in the type 1 light curve in the same way and try to match it in time and maximum magnitude simultaneously, oh, like yes. positioning it about there, I think we get a much better fit. That's I very much better. So judging from that, I think there's no doubt at all that the supernova in Centaurus A really is a type 1 and not a type 2. Paul, we know that a type 2 supernova is due to the implosion and then explosion of a very massive star. What about type 1? The story of the type 1 starts not with one star but with two in a binary system circling one another. One of them happens to be somewhat heavier than the other and it begins to evolve first and it gets larger and it begins to feed material from itself onto its companion. Uh, eventually all of the outer part of the uh, first star, the heavier star, leaks onto the companion and only the core remains. It's uh, a white dwarf star, in fact, um, probably a carbon white dwarf star. And the two stars continue circling around one another. Then the second star, which has now become the heavier one, begins to evolve, and it too grows larger and feeds material back across onto the first again. Now, there's a theorem um, in astrophysics called the Chandrasekhar limit, which says that uh, white dwarf stars may only be as massive as one and a half times the mass of the sun. And if they go over this mass, something dreadful happens. And as the white dwarf, the carbon white dwarf, uh, begins to grow larger and larger by eating, as it were, its companion, um, it goes over the limit. Uh, its temperature goes to 4 billion degrees, and it, it explodes. It detonates. The whole of the carbon ignites in only two seconds, and the star um, uh, explodes into the supernova, which we see as a type 1 supernova. One interesting thing that arises as a consequence of that story is the difference between the two light curves. Uh, the Type 1 supernova light curve has this tail to it, um, and in fact that's powered by the radioactive decay of nickel. Um, it represents some sort of energy input into the supernova explosion from this radioactive decay. And the nickel arises uh, in the explosion. When the white dwarf explodes, it ignites a nuclear explosion. And in the couple of seconds of the explosion, the carbon in it is transformed into calcium, silicon, and so on in a chain that ends up at nickel. The nickel decays radioactively and makes, in the end, the supernova remnant. And the radioactive decay goes through two stages. It goes first to cobalt in a half-life of about six days, and the cobalt goes to iron in a half-life of about 77 days. So in a matter of a few hundred days, virtually all of the white dwarf star has turned into iron. Well, it all sounds highly convincing. Do you think that Centaurus A supernova is going to tell us any more about that? I'm positive it is, because uh, Peter Michael of Imperial College has, uh, was recently awarded time on the Anglo-Australian telescope um, uh, some few months from now to go to try to detect iron uh, lines in the spectrum of uh, the Centaurus A supernova. And I bet you anything you like, he discovers the remains of, um, of uh, one and a half solar masses of iron. Well, that would certainly be final proof that the supernova really is of type 1. But, Paul, it's millions of light years away. Anything might have happened to the light as it travels to us from through space. It's a probe, isn't it, this, um, this light pulse of uh, yes. what happens uh, in space between us and Centaurus A. And I think the first thing to note is the colour of the supernova. Uh, a typical type 1 supernova uh, starts off rather blue and uh, gets a redder after about a month and then gradually fades back to blue again. But supernova 1986G um, has uh, a colour which is distinctly redder than the normal. And this represents um, a colouring effect uh, caused by the dust lane in Centaurus A. Uh, in David Malin's colour picture, uh, you can distinctly see how the dust reddens the light of the stars behind. The dust lane has a, a distinct orange tinge um, and uh, the re excess red colour of uh, the supernova in um, Sena is, is because of this uh, uh, same dust lane. The uh, supernova is not very deep inside the dust lane. It's uh, veiled rather than uh, cloaked. Um, if the dust wasn't there, um, the supernova would be uh, three or so magnitudes brighter. It would be about magnitude seven and a half, and then it would be the brightest supernova of the century. What about the effects on the supernova's light of material in space between us and Centaurus A? 
Well, let's orient ourselves by looking at a cross-section of the Milky Way, uh, with the sun being the yellow star in the lower left-hand corner. We're looking out across 13 million light-years of space to Centaurus A um, in the upper left. Uh, the traces of um, interstellar material show on spectra obtained at the European Southern Observatory by Max Patini and his collaborators. They show at the wavelength of calcium uh, material which formed, which, which exists within about a thousand light years of the sun, the local material if you like. They also show uh, material at about 450 kilometers a second redshift which is um, uh, associated with Centaurus A. In fact, this is a spectrum of interstellar calcium, and the calcium gas at 450 kilometers a second revealed in this spectrum um, it has the redshift of Centaurus A because they're associated one with another. And Centaurus A is moving away from us. Indeed, that's why it has a redshift. Now, the intriguing new observation is the uh, uh, existence of calcium absorption between Centaurus A and us. It shows us peaks at 100 kilometers a second, 250 kilometers a second, and 300 kilometers a second. Uh, what this intergalactic material is doing there, nobody knows. It's a mystery. But we do know that we have seen it before, at least one cloud of it. In 1983, there was a supernova in M83, and the line of sight to M83 passes um, uh, through similar material um, uh, at zero kilometers a second and at the redshift of M83. And also there's a trace of one of the intergalactic clouds, uh, the one at 250 kilometers a second. M83 is a member of the same group as Centaurus A, but it's actually in Hydra, and it does actually rise from Britain, although it's not very bright. It's rather a nice spiral, as you can see from that David Malin picture taken with the AAT, but it was using his 12-inch telescope that Robert Evans discovered his supernova there, which I think was a remarkable achievement. I think it is. I think we owe a lot to Bob Evans for his 13 supernovae, and certainly his last one has sparked off a lot of activity. Astronomers have been plotting its light curve, uh, taking its spectrum and probing regions of space which they haven't discovered, uh, uh, haven't ever investigated before. There's one other important thing, I think. I am told that, uh, in point of fact, there is a possibility that the supernova will indicate that Centaurus A isn't quite as far away as we expected. It may be less than 13 million light years, rather more like 10 million light years. If that does turn out to be the case, what effect is it going to have upon our general distance scale of the universe? Well, all of the distances of all of the galaxies are interrelated, and if uh, the observations of supernovae show that uh, um, galaxies are generally closer than was thought before, that will change our perception of the size of the universe. It will indeed. And you know, Paul, it's quite amazing that this chain of important discoveries was started not at a professional observatory, but by the work of an amateur. And I think everyone owes Robert Evans a great debt of gratitude. And it shows again what the amateur can do in modern astronomy. And before long, um, I hope you'll come back to the sky at night and give us the latest news from Centaurus A. For the moment, from Paul and myself, good night.